So how do we figure out how to, how to take you to Mars um, and, and create a, a self-sustaining city, a, a city that um, is not merely an outpost but can become a planet in its own right um, and for us, thus we could become a truly multi-planet species. Have you ever dreamed of walking on Mars? Well, thanks to SpaceX's mighty starship, that dream might come true. Imagine astronauts setting foot on the red planet, bringing along everything they need to start a whole new city. Sounds exciting, right? But landing on Mars isn't a piece of cake. It's super tricky and needs lots of planning. Stick around and we'll uncover how SpaceX plans to make it happen. You might think, why not Venus or one of those cool moons? Great question. You see, Venus might look like Earth's twin, but trust me, you wouldn't want to live there. It's like a giant oven with temperatures around 863 degrees Fahrenheit or 462 degrees Celsius and an atmosphere that could squish you flat. Yikes. And Mercury, it's a roller coaster of freezing and boiling temperatures. From minus 279 degrees Fahrenheit to 801 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 173 degrees Celsius to 427 degrees Celsius. Living there would be a nightmare. And while the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, we're looking at you, Europa, sound cool and show some promise for future colonization with their potential to sustain life. Landing on them is like parking a car on a mountain of ice. Speaking of Titan, did you know what Cassini found on Titan? If you're curious, like this video, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay in the loop. And as for our trusty moon, we've had some incredible missions, starting with the Apollo program in the 60s and 70s. Over the years, we've seen a whole lineup of lunar explorations, from orbiters and landers to rovers. Take China's Changji missions and the planned International Lunar Research Station, for example. But the real game-changer on the horizon? Plans to build a moon base. NASA, along with international partners, is setting the stage for a permanent lunar outpost near the moon's south pole, where there's a treasure trove of water ice. This base isn't just a pit stop. It's going to be a hub for scientific discovery, resource gathering, and a launch pad for even deeper space missions like getting us to Mars. We're not just visiting the moon anymore, we're moving in and making ourselves at home. In, in fact, um, we now believe that, that early Mars was a lot like Earth. And in fact, if we could warm Mars up, we would once again have a thick, a thick atmosphere and liquid oceans. So back to Mars. Let's say the red planet is like Earth's cool cousin. So Mars becomes the top choice for establishing a multi-planetary civilization. Why? Because it shares some important similarities with Earth. Despite being 50% farther from the sun, Mars gets just enough sunlight to keep things bright. Its atmosphere is packed with carbon dioxide and nitrogen, which could one day help us grow food. Plus, with Mars's gravity at about 37% of Earth's, you could jump higher and carry heavy stuff like a superhero. One of the most striking similarities between Mars and Earth is their composition as terrestrial planets with solid surfaces. These hints at comparable past conditions that might have supported life on Mars. Here's a fun tidbit. A day on Mars, or Sol, is about 40 minutes longer than a day on Earth. More time to sleep in, right? But seriously, this is huge for us humans because it means our bodies could adjust pretty well to life on the red planet. Mars shares many Earth-like surface features, such as clouds, winds, polar ice caps, and geological formations like volcanoes and canyons. Evidence of ancient riverbeds and lakes implies Mars once had a denser atmosphere capable of supporting liquid water. But don't pack your bags just yet. Mars has its downsides too. 
At the same time, Earth's atmosphere is like a cozy blanket. Mars's is more like a flimsy sheet, barely there. Earth's atmosphere weighs about 98,500 pascals of pure pressure, or 14.3 pounds per square inch, but Mars, a measly 610 pascals, or 0.09 pounds per square inch. Translation, the atmosphere is so thin that water boils away quickly, and you'd get sunburned faster than you can say, where's my sunscreen? And what about flying on Mars? Forget it. There's not enough air to keep you afloat. Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. Landing on Mars is no walk in the park. When a Mars rover hits the atmosphere at a blistering 12,500 miles per hour, that's 20,117 kilometers per hour, faster than a speeding bullet. The heat shield is the only thing keeping it from turning into a solar-baked crisp. Next, the parachute deploys, the heat shield is tossed aside, and the rover uses some high-tech navigation to find a safe spot to land. Finally, Rockets slow it down, and a sky crane gently lowers it to the surface. If everything goes perfectly, it's mission accomplished. If not, well, let's not think about that. Would you take the seven minutes of terror landing on Mars? Tell us in the comments below. Now here's where things get really tricky. Landing something heavy on Mars, like trying to land a sumo wrestler on a tightrope. The InSight lander, for instance, used thrusters that dug trenches into the Martian surface upon touchdown. This highlights just one of the many challenges we encounter when landing larger payloads on Mars. To solve this, engineers are thinking outside the box, or should we say, outside the parachute. They're working on a huge inflatable decelerator. Think of it as a giant airbag for Mars, paired with a massive parachute potentially stretching to 26 feet or 8 meters in diameter. This combo could help slow down those heavy payloads enough to land safely. Back in 2018, NASA successfully landed the InSight lander using technology that dates back to the Viking era of the 1970s. The Viking missions were the first to land on Mars, and they pioneered much of the technology and techniques that are still in use today. Although refined over the years, the core concepts of entry, descent, and landing, such as using parachutes, heat shields, and retro rockets, were originally developed during this early era of Mars exploration. But if we want to send bigger stuff, like habitats or vehicles, we need to level up our game. The future of Mars exploration depends on making some giant technological leaps. We're talking about new landing techniques, bigger rockets, and super precise navigation. It's all about controlling the descent, hitting the landing spot with pinpoint accuracy, and efficiently using the propulsion system. In other words, it's like performing a perfect Olympic dive, except you're doing it on another planet, and the stakes are sky high. Oh, did you know a group of owls is called a parliament? Sounds fancy, right? Now back to Mars. On September 28, 2016, Elon Musk laid the blueprint for getting humans to Mars. Spoiler, it's not easy. We're talking full reusability, refueling in orbit, and making propellant on Mars. These are the key elements that are needed in order to uh, achieve the four and a half order of magnitude improvement. Most of the, the improvement would come from full reusability, somewhere between two and two and a half orders of magnitude. And then the other two orders of magnitude would come from refilling in orbit, uh, propellant production on Mars, and choosing the right propellant. SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy Rocket are the keys to overcoming these challenges. Together, they make up the most powerful launch system 
ever created. At 394 feet, or 120 meters tall, Starship is a behemoth, capable of carrying up to 150 metric tons of cargo to Mars. Musk has also hinted at making Starship even taller, potentially 500 feet, or 150 meters, to increase its chances of success. The idea is simple, bigger rocket, bigger payload, bigger impact on Mars. And don't forget, Starship is fully reusable, a game changer for space exploration. This means SpaceX can launch, land, refuel, and launch again without building a new rocket each time. Did you know that SpaceX plans to make fuel on Mars? Yep, they're working to turn Martian resources into rocket fuel, which will help Starship make the return trip to Earth. Talk about being self-sufficient. Still with us? Congrats, you're officially my favorite person, but don't stop here. This is just the tip of the iceberg. To really get the whole picture, you need to check out our video on NASA's abandoned Mars colony plan. Trust me, this video you just watched, it makes more sense if you see the whole story. So go ahead, click over to the next one, and let's keep this journey going.